Gwedi, Gwedi. <laughs> you know, Gwedi is always in his office in Lutuli House. I don't think he even leaves Lutuli House because he's scared they won't let him back in again. <laughs> I must, oh, here I've got a microphone. Oh, this is so exciting. Thank you so much. Bye, donkey. I am here, thank you all, first of all, to, uh, to Urban Lime for allowing me to address you here today. I'm just up the road, not in the President's house. Uh, this is the closest I will ever get to President Zuma. Um, but I have been talking to some people from the various branches of the African National Congress, and all of that, of course, will remain uh, secret. Um, I must also just thank the Dennis Hurley uh, people for this beautiful outfit, this beautiful dress, this, oh, look at it, just let me show you. Thank you so much. It's so beautiful, I, I can't wait to show the student course of Zana Dlamini Zuma. <laughs> My granddaughter said, you can tell her, Gogo, that you don't have to be shwe shwe black to be shwe shwe beautiful. <laughs> And so, um, Gwedi Mantashe made sure on that phone call that I would not divert from my speech, because as you know, as a member of the African National Congress, we have to stick to the written word. So here it is. Sayavona, Dumela, Molo, hello, and to any representatives of the American, European, and British media, salam. <laughs> John F. Kennedy said, it is not what your country can do for you, it is what you can do for your country. Martin Luther King said, I had a dream, and Donald Trump said, you're fired. <laughs> My name is Evita Pesetne, and I say, it is not what South Africa can do for us, it is what we can do for South Africa. Yes, I had a dream, there is one thing I want to say to quite a few people in government. You're fired. To many of you, I am a familiar white face, icon to some, icona to others. Having been part of your lives in South Africa since 1978, I was then just the wife of a National Party MP. My husband, Dr. Yee de Fibusaifnet, was in the cabinet of Hendrik Verwoerd. He had two portfolios. He was Minister of Black Housing and Minister of Water Affairs. And to save money for the taxpayer, he combined his two portfolios by building a black township in a dam. <laughs> in 1981, I became the South African ambassador to the independent black homeland republic of Barbetti Kusweti. In 1994, President Nelson Mandela dissolved all the Bantustans into one black homeland called South Africa. And I lost my job. I am now a member of the African National Congress, and as such, you will appreciate that I may not make any comment or declaration here on behalf of the party. As you know, we members of the ANC are not allowed opinions about anything. <laughs> of course, it goes without saying that there is freedom of speech in the Tully House. It is just after speech that freedom goes. Recently, I've had my share of hashtags. The most repeated accusation is that I voted for apartheid. Yes, as a member of the National Party, I did. Maybe I'm the only white South African to admit it. But understand that if I hadn't voted for apartheid, when I did vote for apartheid, I would have been locked up in prison as a communist and a terrorist, and I would have been the Minister of Higher Education today. <laughs> I am not a minister, or a director general, or a policy maker. I am just another cadre in this former liberation movement, now the government of South Africa. As soon as I joined the party, I realized what I had to do to contribute to our future in this democracy of the people, for the people, by the people, who seem to have forgotten the people. So I put the cabinet on a very strict diet. It is not a state secret. Most of them are too fat. <laughs> and an overweight government underthinks. You just have to look at a fat politician to think of the millions of thin voters in our country who are getting poorer and thinner. All Julius Malema has to do to prepare for the 2019 general election is promise them everything and anything, and they will vote him into power democratically as our next president. And uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just Google Weimar Republic. 
And then you can also Google Adolf Hitler 1929. And I might add humbly, my diet has been a great success. Members of cabinet can now be seen to fit into economy class seats on SAA. So why am I in the ANC? Some have said seeing Evita Bersaignet in the ANC is like seeing Angela Merkel as a Greek bank manager. <laughs> I'm in the ANC because I was challenged by my three black grandchildren. Well, never. I don't see them as black. Are they not black? They're not white? They are Barack Obama beige. <laughs> they said to me, Gogo, what are you going to do to protect democracy? So that one day when we need to vote freely and fairly, democracy will still be there in full working condition. So that is my challenge and my commitment to the future of all our young people. Someone has to be in the heart of power to keep an eye on the fragile ball of democracy. It is as easy to blame state capture for the successes of corruption as it is to blame apartheid for the failures of government. Lutuli House needs to fix this mess. It is the headquarters of the African National Congress and probably the only and most active power station that the ANC has bothered to build in the last 24 years. <laughs> the lights in our democratic establishments are dimming rapidly. Carelessly, Parliament is no longer the center of people's power. It has become either a DA parking garage or a playpen for the Teletubbies of the EFF. That will have to change urgently if we are to avoid another armed struggle. On the 27th of April 1994, millions of South Africans queued up to vote for the very first time, and many of them voted many times. <laughs> the change from a one-party state to our multi-party democracy was a peaceful and joyous reality. Being in my kitchen in Lutuli House has proved once again that it is one place where service delivery is essential. One slip up in your kitchen your customers find somewhere else to spend their time and their money. Service delivery is the oxygen of freedom. Lack of service delivery creates a vacuum that is easily filled with corruption. Corruption? Yeah. During apartheid and its regime, corruption did not exist. It was called policy. <laughs> we had Ruperts and Oppenheimers. And we had Leutz, not Guptas. We didn't have social media, hashtags or tweets. We had tightly controlled media and a police-run national broadcaster. We didn't, have to, we didn't have critical headlines and breaking news because we wrote those headlines and broke that news <laughs> and nearly got away with it. Today in the civilized world, democratically elected governments are finding democratically accepted ways to destroy democracy. Corruption has once again become policy from the White House to 10 Downing Street, from the Kremlin to Beijing, from Saxon World to Nkanda. Comrades in Lutuli House enjoy the joke at my expense. Comrade Evita Bersaignes was once in Parliament and Minister Dlamini was in the kitchen. Now it's vice versa. <laughs> yes, fake news, but not funny. But yes, Yes, a little bit funny. Sadly, there are few jokes to lighten up the murky reality of politics as usual. As you know, we are all focusing on the Congress, accepted, expected in December, where a new leader of the ANC will emerge to be the future president of South Africa. The list is a who's who of what was, what is, <coughs> and what shouldn't be. Cyril Ramaphosa, Nkosirana Dlamini Zuma, Baleka Mbeti, Lindiwe Sisulu, Matthews Poza, Zweli Mkise, Jeff Radebe, and the list grows daily. It has become our version of idols, of the X Factor, of the voice, if only the, if only the apprentice. Candidates and factions are canvassing among voters and local branches, making loud promises to attract more approval. May the best comrade win. Yes, but must South Africa lose? <coughs> I'm not the ex-wife of a sitting president. I'm not the daughter of two struggle icons. I'm not the embattled co-author of a constitution. 
I'm not a minister in the presidency who enjoys collecting photographs of female friends. I'm not anything other than me, a gogo, a citizen, and some call a designer democrat. Some can add names to that, but one thing I can tell you for certain, I'm no longer a white South African. I'm a South African who is not black. And so as President Kennedy said, Martin Luther thought, and Donald Trump forgot. Allow me humbly to announce herewith to you and the world media. And I can repeat that with conviction in four of the 11 official languages. I am hereby making myself available as a candidate for the presidency of the African National Congress. <laughs> There are two powerful women already in the race. They need help. <laughs> there are a cluster of powerful men already choosing their presidential bowings from the brochure. They need to be brought down to earth. But there is a difference, not just in color, but in context. I don't want to be the president of a party or the president of a country. I don't have to be those things, you see. I am a citizen of a democracy. And that gives me more power and pride than any blue light brigade. All the above mentioned candidates are telling the comrades and cadres in the party what they want to hear in order to get their votes. I don't want you to vote for me. And so I'm going to tell you the things you don't want to hear. Someone must expose the truth. Let us unleash a new armed struggle against state capture, corruption, and fakeness with the Constitution as our weapon of choice. If the candidate elected in December is not the right person, male or female, who will ruthlessly cut away the cancer of corruption, imprison the gangsters disguised as leaders, and clean the sandbox of power, which the fat cats have soiled with their Saxon world diarrhea, we will lose our country. It's that simple. That is the first truth from me that you don't want to hear. There will be more to come. So till then, in this year of Oliver Tambo, allow him the last words. The children of any nation are its future. A country, a movement, a person who does not value its youth and children does not deserve its future. Thank you. Thank you. Were you listening, Gwenny? No, I stuck to this group. Well, more or less. Alfred, you later. Oh, my liver Ada, I would like to ask if you have questions because free speech is so important in Natal and of course in Durban or parts of Durban. Um, I just want to say this is so wonderful being here. You might remember Nelson Mandela made his first speech of, in, in freedom on the parade in Cape Town standing on a balcony in the sunset with somebody else's reading glasses on and reading a script that somebody else also wrote. It's so warm look now. And then, of course, and then, of course, as you know, Donald Trump made his entrance on an escalator with Mrs. Trump on another escalator. <laughs> but I am here in a stairwell, which is very pertinent, because all the best things started in stairwells, on balconies, and sometimes on escalators. I just want to make very certain that you all know who made me look so lovely. My beautiful gown was especially created by Paige Garbett and the Sewing for Africa Skills Development Job Creation Group at the proactive Dennis Hurley Center in Durban, made out of bespoke Dennis Hurley Center Shwe Shwe. I must say, I didn't realize this was Dennis Hurley. I thought it was Oliver Tambo because they do look alike in red. <laughs> <laughs> and so thank you. If there are any questions, I would be very happy to. But yes, my dear. What are you doing in Durban? What am I doing in Durban? What a very interesting question. I'm here to entertain people with their fear. I start tonight 
at the Snedden Theatre with a very interesting Mbizo. Uh, people call it Ibita Poseidon and the Cactus of Separate Development. It is a journey that I will take you through from where we were to where we are going but constantly reminding ourselves that we are still the luckiest people in the world to be in a democracy where we can laugh at our fear.